As an important part of nearly every RPG, side quests often offer players the chance to venture off the beaten path of the main story to risk life, limb, and sometimes even sanity for valuable rewards. Now, it's expected for a side quest to offer some challenge and mystery to the player. That being said, most are found and completed in pretty organic and expected ways during a standard playthrough. But sometimes that's not the case. And like other RPGs, Final Fantasy has had its fair share of side quests that have caused more than one player to abandon them. Whether it's easy fail states, convoluted prerequisites for completion, or even just the fact that they can be bypassed altogether by accident, these quests are the ones that have driven generations of players up the proverbial demon wall and had them reaching for the nearest strategy guide. And it's precisely these side quests that we're going to focus on today, the ones that required some extra help to discover, decipher, and complete. So here's seven infuriating side quests that we're sure you weren't able to finish without a guide. And with the added caveat that there will only be one quest featured per game, let's kick things off with the criminally convoluted collection quest related to the Stelazio coins. Collectathons are a video game staple and are especially present in role playing games. From mini medals in Dragon Quest XI to Mimam in Shin Megami Tensei V, finding all of the MacGuffins and collecting the rewards for your treasure hunting is usually a side quest worth undertaking, even if locating every last one can sometimes prove more frustrating than fun. In Final Fantasy IX, the main collectibles were the Stelazio coins, and the quest to find them was available from the start of the player's adventure, even if they had not yet met their collector, Queen Stella. In fact, by the time the player did venture to Trino and met Queen Stella, they were likely able to claim a few rewards from this quest already, as the Ares and Cancer coins were both found easily while following the critical path of the main story. The others though would prove to be a little less obvious to obtain. Often located in places the player would not think to check or even possibly go to, finding the rest of these coins required the player to search every nook and cranny of the areas they were passing through. Some even acquired the player to interact with the correct location multiple times like the fountain in Trino, which would only yield the Gemini coin after the player threw 10 gillen a total of 13 times in a row. To top things off, after collecting all 12 of the Zodiac themed coins, players would then have to decipher the clues found on each of them to locate the 13th hidden off Yucas coin, a location which just so happened to be the same as the Scorpio coin. Collecting every coin would net the players all the rewards Queen Stella had to offer. These included the Blood Sword for Steiner, the Rosetta Ring, and the awesome Robe of Laws. But most importantly, it would grant players access to the Hammer, which was a special item that could be fused by Hades to create Steiner's ultimate armor, the Tin Armor, or alternatively held onto until the end of the game to view an additional secret scene. As there were a few concrete clues to help the player find the Stelazio coins, completing this quest would prove difficult without a guide. Luckily though, none of the coins were permanently missable, meaning the player was free to hunt for these coins to their heart's content. Over the years, Final Fantasy has had its fair share of minigames that have become entities in and of themselves, like Chocobo Breeding and the ever-popular Blitzball. That being said, few have transcended their original appearance as much as Triple Triad. In its initial appearance, Triple Triad proved to be a near essential distraction to engage with, especially if the player wished to have access to the best items, weapons, and spells. This was due to the fact that the rarer cards could be converted into a wide variety of materials and magic, and the best way to obtain the rarest of these cards was through the convoluted Queen of Cards quest. Available as early as the first time the lantern was acquired to go to Balam, this quest involved talking to the enigmatic figure known only as, you guessed it, the Queen of Cards. While her primary function in the game was to spread new Triple Triad rules from one region to another, she also served a secondary purpose if the player happened to challenge her to a card game herself. This was because, by playing Triple Triad against the Queen of Cards, the player had the chance to win newer, rarer cards, just not from her. While it seemed counterintuitive at first, losing specific rare cards to the Queen on purpose caused new ones to be created, that were then available to be won by the player should they challenge the specific NPC that happened to have them. 
The sticking point here though is that gaining and losing the correct rare cards could prove to be quite the hassle. This was due to a couple of factors. First off, the queen did not always appear in the same place, meaning the player had to hunt her down each time. Some of the cards also had to be acquired from other side quests or by playing a lot of Triple Triad. And finally, the nature of the rules of Triple Triad itself made winning and losing the right games much more difficult depending on how the player let them spread. With good guidance, a bit of patience and a lot of luck though, this quest would ultimately prove to be quite lucrative, rewarding the player with cards like Doom Train and Phoenix which could not be obtained anywhere else. In addition, the rare cards the player had to lose on purpose were not lost forever, as they could be won back from the Queen's son. This meant that partaking in this quest could seriously tip the scales in the player's favour, as by gaining new cards while maintaining their old ones, large portions of the game could be trivialised by the spoils gained from modding their card collection. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII and its remake Crisis Core Reunion really capitalised upon the segmented nature of its portable routes by offering players a multitude of bite-sized side quests and missions they could accomplish in quick succession. While most of these were available at any time, some were locked to specific parts of the game's main story, and of these, few had as many accidental fail states and points of no return as the Seven Wonders of Nibelheim quest. Found in Chapter 8, when the player travelled to Nibelheim to relive the infamous Nibelheim incident from Final Fantasy VII, this quest was an easy one to miss. Talking to the right NPC as soon as the player had control of Zack, but before talking to Sephiroth inside the inn, the player would be tasked with investigating the seven wonders around the town and its outskirts. Why this proved to be so infuriating was due to the fact that this section of the game had key story beats that, when progressed either on purpose or accidentally, would lock the player out of completing not only the wonder they were currently on, but all the wonders that followed, rendering the quest uncompletable. It meant that to complete this quest, the player would have to talk to the NPC, investigate carefully, return with their findings, get the information of the next wonder and repeat, all while carefully progressing the story piece by piece in a way that did not halt their progress. As places like the Nibelheim mountain path and the Shunra Manor needed to be explored prior to, but also after certain events, this meant that the player would have to have a really good memory of how the story played out, or a really detailed guide in order to not mess things up. Ultimately, the rewards here were well worth the effort though, as completing the quest in full would grant the player useful items like the Phoenix and War Materia alongside some fun consolation prizes. Final Fantasy IV saw the franchise enter into the 16-bit era with renewed focus on the core narrative. This came with added linearity in the campaign, but astute players could still find side diversions here and there, if they knew where to look. When travelling through the underworld in search of the sealed cave in the upgraded Falcon airship, inquisitive players may have been able to locate the Sylvan Cave in the northwestern area of the map. This cave, home to many treasures and some tricky foes, also held another secret. They are presumed to be deceased ally, Yang, who after nobly sacrificing himself in the Tower of Babel to save his friends, was in fact still alive, albeit unconscious, and unaware of their presence. While at the time it seemed as though there was nothing the player could do about Yang's condition, if the player then happened to return to Fabul and speak to Yang's wife, Sheila, they might have been surprised when she gave them the frying pan key item with to which, well, hit Yang over the head to wake him up. While striking an already injured person with a frying pan may seem counterintuitive, we can only assume it came from a place of love, and if the player were to return to Yang and do exactly that, then they would find their friend revitalised, although sadly he would not join their party. Instead, the player was rewarded with the Sylph Summon for Rydia, but that's not all this quest had to offer. If they happened to return to Yang's wife in Fabul, they would then be additionally rewarded with the kitchen knife or the kitchen spoon in the original translation, an extremely powerful weapon which, while unequipable, could be thrown at the enemy once to deal massive amounts of damage. This whole exchange, while simple in execution, was quite easy to miss if you didn't know it existed, and likely left many wondering how they completely bypassed picking up an additional summon. Now, chocobos have been a part of Final Fantasy's history ever since the initial release of Final Fantasy II, often being used for enemy-free transportation on the world map. 
As a game packed with mini games and action set pieces, Final Fantasy VII would see Chocobos return once again in one of the most robust ways they ever had. At the center of a deep, time-consuming and labyrinth-like side quest involving the breeding, racing and riding of the iconic bird. In Final Fantasy VII, Chocobos came in multiple varieties, with each type granting a different kind of mobility to the player when mounted in the overworld. Standard yellow Chocobos could only go where Cloud could go on foot, albeit faster. Blue and green Chocobos could cross shallow water and mountains respectively. Black Chocobos could cross both, and the coveted gold Chocobo could cross all terrain and go literally anywhere on the map. Obtaining a gold Chocobo was no easy task though, but by breeding and then raising various Chocobos in precisely the right way, the player could eventually net this elusive prize. This would in turn allow them to travel to otherwise inaccessible areas known as Materia Caves and obtain some of the most powerful materia in the game such as Quadra Magic, Mime, HP to MP and the ultimate summon, Knights of the Round. What made this quest so infuriatingly difficult to complete without a guide though was the amount of specific knowledge and items required to succeed, most of which was never explicitly explained to the player. To obtain the gold chocobo, the player would need to first buy stables from Chocobo Bill after acquiring the High Wind. They would then need to capture chocobos from specific locations with chocobo lure materia and obtain expensive greens. After that, they would then need to race chocobos in the gold saucer to raise their stats. And finally, they would need to keep breeding their champion chocobos until they could mate a black chocobo with a wonderful ranked chocobo. Additionally, some of the items required for this process were only obtainable from specific enemies, such as the Zeo Nut from the Goblins on Goblin Island, and this added an additional layer of randomness to the whole process. It meant that while this wasn't mechanically challenging, as anyone with the right set of instructions and a good deal of time could accomplish the task, the Chocobo Breeding side quest was definitely one we doubt many players figured out alone, or at least on their first try, unless they happened to be extremely lucky or very committed. Recruiting new units in Final Fantasy Tactics was a core part of what made the game so engaging, and building your team up from a ragtag collection of fresh-faced freelancers to a squadron of skilled warriors was extremely satisfying and rewarding for those willing to put the time in. Unbeknownst to many though, the game also had a few hidden, unlockable, unique characters that could be obtained, one of which, at the time of Tactics' release, was quite the monumental figure in the video game zeitgeist. This character, of course, was none other than Cloud Strife. Like the other secret characters, recruiting Cloud would only be possible through a series of less than obvious events, but it was made even trickier due to one tiny detail. Cloud could be found in Chapter 4 after the party defeated Belias. In order to kick off the process, the player would first have to ensure that the character Mastadia was in their party when visiting the clockwork city of Gaug, which in turn would activate the side quest to Mastadio's father, Besrudio. What would follow was a series of long events that involved the recruitment of other side characters, backtracking to previously visited locations and completing a few optional battles. To recruit Cloud though, an extremely missable step would have needed to have been completed by a certain point in this chain, which made the whole process quite annoying. Travelling to the trade city of Salgidos for the first time, the player would witness a scene with a very familiar looking flower girl. The Cloud would only be recruitable if they then proceeded to buy the flower from her, prior to Mustadio's father revealing the dimensional portal device that would eventually summon the famous protagonist. It meant that while it was fun to see Aerith and Cloud in Final Fantasy Tactics, and including them in an optional side quest was a fantastic and organic idea, it was a little frustrating that meeting them hinged on such a specific set of actions that were easy to bypass altogether. The side quest involved in the optional characters though was, on the whole, a worthwhile undertaking, as it would end up netting the player many potential powerful party members, a useful thing when a game features permadeath. For our final infuriating side quest that we can assume most people didn't do without a guide, we've decided to focus on obtaining the Zodiac Spear in the original PlayStation 2 release of Final Fantasy XII. Ultimate weapons should never be too easy to obtain, but in the case of the Zodiac Spear, it was less hard work that was needed and more extreme luck. That, or some kind of psychic ability. This is because there were two ways to obtain the Zodiac Spear in the original game, and both likely had legions of players pulling out their hair. 
The first way involved a set of 16 chests laid out in a grid in the Necrol of Narbudis. Located in one of these chests, the spear was easy enough to pick up. No big boss fights, convoluted side quests or mini games to complete, just opening the right chest. Sounds easy enough, right? The problem was that while the Zodiac Spear was indeed inside the chest, a number of small things could cause it to not be inside the chest. And these were basically unknown to the player. To begin, there were four specific chests located throughout the rest of the world that absolutely could not be opened at any time. Located in Rabanasta and its royal palace, the Nalbina dungeons and the Font Coast, if any of these were opened by the player, the Zodiac Spear would no longer be available in the Necrol. To make matters worse, the Zodiac Spear would also not appear if the player had any diamond armlets equipped, an extremely easy oversight. If the first method was rendered null and void through any of these reasons, the player could attempt to obtain the Zodiac Spear in the Hen Mines Phase 2 Dig. This method required the player to have beaten and obtained 10 espers, as well as completed the Mind Flare Hunt, and if so, the spear would appear in a chest deep inside the mines. Anyone hopeful of using this method though was going to need a lot of patience. The chest containing the Zodiac Spear only appeared 10% of the time, with a 10% chance of it being an item, and a 10% chance of that item being the Zodiac Spear. And as if this wasn't madness inducing enough, this time the game also required the player to have the diamond armlet equipped in order for the spear to appear. How anyone could have sorted this out without a guide on their first playthrough, especially with one method requiring the diamond armlet and the other specifically not, is beyond us. One thing is for sure though, no matter how the player acquired the weapon, they definitely earned the power it bestowed on them, and more. And that, as they say, is that. They were seven infuriating side quests that we're sure you weren't able to finish without a guide. We know there's probably a few we didn't include though, so be sure to let us know in the comments below which side quests had you running for the internet for answers. And if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galson D. Kajata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Zukan TDK, who are Super Special Onion Night supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.